Welcome to the Highland Club in Fort Augusta, Scotland, on the shores of the famous Loch Ness. This isn't one of my typical hotel reviews because, well, this isn't a hotel at all. It's more like a condominium situation where the apartments are owned by individuals and some are rented out through management companies, Airbnb, and similar services. So this isn't even a review as such, but rather just a tour of an apartment we rented and some of our experiences at the Highland Club and Fort Augustus. Because the apartments are owned by different people and are quite different to each other in many ways, unlike in a hotel, there's no guarantee that what I'm showing you is representative of what you should expect in general. But I'm hoping that it helps you out in some way if you're planning a visit. That being said, I'll spoil the conclusion by saying that we thoroughly enjoyed our time here, and based on our four-night stay, I'd recommend it. Coming up the tree line drive reveals the main building, an amalgamation of old and new. It's pretty clear which is which, the ancient masonry of the original St. Benedict's Abbey, constructed around 1880, contrasting sharply with the beige architecture completed in 2012. Shortly after our arrival, we were met in the car park by a gentleman from Anak Moor, the management company for our apartment. He brought us through the front entrance into the hallways of the monastery. I quite like the ambiance of this place. When we were there in mid-October, it was pretty quiet, and maybe it is all the time, giving the public spaces a solemn and even mournful and creepy atmosphere. And I mean that in a good way. This is a bit embarrassing, but I did not get a single bit of footage or pictures of the interior of the modern parts of the building. However, you can get the idea from the door to the apartment. It's about as plain as the exterior of the 2012 editions. At any rate, welcome to apartment 6 at the Highland Club. We walk right into a foyer, offering a multitude of choices of where to go next. Based on the heaviness of the doors and the fact that they were self-closing, I'm guessing this closed-off design was there more to meet fire safety regulations than a stylistic choice. And so far it's nothing to write home about, but wait until you see the main living area. This is where the new meets old, and I rather enjoy the stark difference between the heavy intricate stonework and the clean white drywall. We'll get back to the dining room and kitchen, but the living room is well furnished with a deep and comfortable red leather sofa, a large riveted stainless steel coffee table, and a big TV. The decor is definitely eclectic, but I'd rather have interesting than boring any day of the week, and that's part of the reason why we chose this place. Before checking out the main area in more detail, let's head back into the foyer and see what's behind doors number 2 and 3. This one is a small utility closet housing the freezer and cleaning supplies, amongst other things. Over here is the first of two full bathrooms. I've talked before about how much I like having two bathrooms, so I won't get into that again. There's a fairly small stand-up shower with adjustable handheld nozzle. It's got a pretty standard, yet perfectly clean and functional, sink and toilet. The heat for the room is from this towel warmer slash radiator with a small clothes hamper and some decorative photos in the corner. Overall pretty basic, but well fitted, tidy, and work just fine. The only other route out of the foyer is up this staircase, which reveals yet more doors as options. On this side is the secondary bedroom with a queen-size bed. It's not a big room, but it's got a reasonable amount of storage between the dresser and the small closet in the corner. And there's a window over here, but I'm not sure why. It overlooks the stairwell, but there's no natural light over there. I mean, nothing to complain about, just a weird bit of architecture. So, let's move on. Across the little hall is the door to the main bedroom. It's really more of a loft, presenting a great view of the original architecture. I feel like this is maybe a little unfair because, as I said, this isn't a review as such, but man, those were some thin pillows in a super hard bed. The second bathroom is right where you'd want it to be. It's fitted out in the same way as the one downstairs, with the exception of a large bathtub. And the shower is about the same size and configuration. 
I didn't go so far as to measure this particular toilet, but there it is. As possibly to be expected with self-catering, the only amenity provided was basic hand soap. Only a couple towels on show, but there were more on the bed along with plush bathrobes. Or, uh, dressing gowns as they might be known. Back in the bedroom, there's a fairly large closet for any of your hangable clothes, as well as a smaller one which included a safe. Uh, sorry it's out of focus, but you get the idea. The dining room was probably the best place to enjoy the ancient architecture, and it shares the same space as the fully equipped kitchen. One of the reasons we chose this unit was for the stonework and the stained glass windows. They really were lovely, particularly around sundown. A microwave, tea and coffee, four burner gas stove, fancy four slice toaster, and bread bin in the style of a rubbish bin. Real trash and recycling cans as well, of course. The island holds the sink, but for real convenience there is a dishwasher fitted from the Candy Company. You are now about to enter the nerve center to the entire Wonka factory. There's a complete set of flatware, as well as a robust amount of kitchen utensils and pots and pans. Over on the other side are cutting boards, baking trays, and more. There's really nothing you'd be lacking even during a long-term stay. For example, this washer-dryer combo came in real handy. I love having one of these in a hotel or apartment when on vacation, because it means being able to pack half the clothes, or at least not re-wearing stuff. Below the hob is a standard size oven. Next to that is the fridge hidden behind the cabinetry just like the washing machine. It doesn't have a freezer section, but the dedicated freezer in the closet of the foyer takes care of that. Topping off this area are cups and dishes, more than enough for the two of us. In the British Standard, all appliances are separately powered through switches, something to look out for when traveling, as that's almost never seen in the US. Around the other side of the island are serving dishes of various kinds. This is one of the better equipped kitchens I've seen at a vacation rental. All this stuff was in great condition too, not used nor abused by previous guests, as you sometimes find. In case you're wondering, this immense clock face is just part of the decor and never moves. Back in the living room, the large TV is fed by both live television and a Blu-ray player. Of course, since this isn't a hotel, there was no issue switching HDMI inputs over to my Roku. And speaking of which, internet was reliable and more than fast enough at 66 megabits down and 18.5 megabits up and we were able to stream HD video from our Plex server all the way back in New York with no problem. The only weird thing is that it appeared to be a DSL modem. I didn't know DSL even went that fast. Under the TV, there is a drawer full of books on one side and a library of DVDs on the other. Very thoughtful of the owners to provide some alternative entertainment. On that note, I didn't get a shot of it, but in another drawer on the far side of the lounge was an assortment of board games. All of the apartments at the Highland Club are marketed as self-catering, a term which I guess is sort of self-explanatory but not common back home. It essentially means there are no hotel-style services. If you've rented a house or apartment via Airbnb or VRBO, it's the same idea. They provide all the regular household stuff like towels, sheets, blankets, kitchen supplies, and maybe even some condiments, seasoning, soaps and shampoo, and other accoutrements, but not meals or daily cleaning services. Despite staying in a lot of full-service hotels in this channel, I actually prefer this hands-off, self-service approach in most situations, especially if there are restaurants and shops in walking distance. The Highland Club is situated on the south end of Loch Ness, surrounded on two other sides by the River Tarf and the Caledonian Canal. The grounds offer not only great views of the loch, but also the architecture and some other interesting things like the Monk's Graveyard, the giant chess set cloistered in the courtyard of the building, verdant fields, and wooded paths alongside the river. On site are gym facilities, an indoor pool, and tennis court, all free of charge but requiring reservations. Other activities include billiards, table tennis, an outdoor play area, polo, and bowls, all of which are do-it-yourself.
The Boathouse Restaurant is on premises as well, which is casual dining on the edge of the lock. This is an example of the fare and prices on offer while we were there. I mean, it may have changed by the time you see this, but I got haggis, neeps, and tatties as usual. This place has good, solid comfort food. I'd recommend it, and certainly it's quite convenient. The High Street of Fort Augustus is an easy walk away, with a small spa market, gas station, pharmacy, lots of tourist gift shops, and restaurants. And during our stay, we hit up a few of those. The first place we hit up was the Moorings Restaurant, which was not what its overall online reviews would lead you to believe. Our waiter was friendly, and the halloumi, Turkish salad, and hummus were really quite tasty. Amanda even took the salad back to the apartment in a takeaway container and ate it the next day. The recent reviews are a mixed bag of highs and lows, so I'm not sure what the deal is, but based on our meal there, I'd recommend it at any rate. On the flip side of that, there's no ambiguity at all when it comes to delightfulness. They absolutely lived up to their online ratings. We stopped in for quick lunch, and Amanda and I split a ham, cheese, and tomato sandwich that was downright excellent. On the side of that is Stovies, a potato and beef stew basically. Also delicious. Not only was the food great, but the couple that owns the place were super friendly and just nice people in general. I'd say this is a must visit in Fort Augustus, though keep in mind they're only open for lunch. They're situated right on the Caledonian locks, uh, that is the actual boat locks, not the Loch Ness lock that the locks connect to, which are a nice place for boat watching and some great views. And it's a beautiful little town. On our last night in the area, we had dinner at Beaufort House Pizza. It's a really small establishment, also run by a husband and wife team, and also a big surprise. Hand-stretched dough and fresh ingredients made to order. And they have chili oil, one of my favorite pizza toppings. Uh, well, now aside from haggis, I guess. I've told a lot of people about this one since we got back home, and everyone is immediately suspicious of the idea. But if you're ever there, do yourself a favor and try the Highlander pizza. The combo of cheese, haggis, red onion, and their sweet chili jam is amazing. The only downside about this place is that the dining room and kitchen are pretty small, so at busy times they may not be able to accommodate you even for a takeaway. But in my opinion, it'd be worth the wait for a table. Aside from some light souvenir shopping and strolling around, the only other thing we did in Fort Augustus proper was a tour with Cruise Loch Ness on the Spirit of Loch Ness. It was about an hour-long trip north into the lake, with one of the staff members on a PA giving an educational, yet casual and sometimes quite funny, narration. I'd recommend it for the scenery, and the crew also helped make for a pleasant trip. The only downside for us is that the cruise wasn't going out at all for the first couple of days we were there, I'm not sure why exactly, and we got some genuine Scottish weather on our last day. No surprise, as it was late October, so first we stopped off at Kiltane in the Caledonian Canal Center to buy hats and gloves. Oh, and this, this guy might have ruined his Surface tablet in the rain. And I guess you gotta do what you gotta do to get pictures. Overall, I'd recommend staying at the Highland Club. The apartments are a mixed bag being from a variety of owners, but most of the ones we looked at online had lots of pictures of the interiors, so you'd probably get a good idea of what you're in for before you commit. Uh, Fort Augustus is a nice town with lovely people. Particularly during the high season, there seemed to be a lot of outdoor activities in the area like kayaking, guided hikes, fishing, clay shooting, horseback riding, and so forth. We ended up booking here because of the last minute cancellation of our trip on Belmont's Royal Scotsman train. Video on that fiasco upcoming. While we certainly had a relaxing and fun five days, if you have a car and are looking for more fun and adventure, it might be worth it to stay here for just a couple of nights and then delve further into the highlands. Simply driving through this part of the world was a beautiful experience, especially as we got lucky with sunny weather most of the way. In other words, in retrospect, I wish we'd seen more. Eh, we'll just have to go back sometime. Now just a word of warning, what did throw us off during the booking process is that there are a bunch of different websites associated with the Highland Club name. There's the highlandclub.co.uk, which I believe is the official site. Then there's highlandclubscotland.co.uk, and highlandclubdirect.com, and anachmore.co.uk, the last one being the management company that ultimately handled our booking. And aside from those sites, 
Highland Club Apartments are also cross-listed on Airbnb, VRBO, Expedia, Booking.com, and other sites. We went with Airbnb as, frankly, it got confusing to know which site was quote-unquote the correct one. I mean, I'm sure they're all legitimate, but because they're probably run by different companies, they may or may not offer different apartments to each other, and may or may not have different standards of customer service. That's the only downside in that it wasn't really clear with whom we were dealing other than Airbnb. And since Amanda and I both have Airbnb accounts, we went with the devil we knew for simplicity. So unfortunately, I can't speak to the efficacy of booking through those other sites, but just wanted to let you know that there are options. Thanks for watching through till the end. If you enjoyed this video or found it useful in planning your own trip, Hitting a like button, leaving a comment, or even subscribing would help out the channel a lot with the YouTube algorithm.